Hi and welcome everyone. We'll give it a moment for you to get connected to audio. All right, Zami, it looks like everyone is connected to audio. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Misty. And hello and welcome, everyone. For folks who don't know me, my name is Zami Tanashe Hemingway. My pronouns are Zami, he and him. And I am the Capacity Building Assistance or SEBA Gender Affirming Project Manager with Denver Prevention Training Center. If everyone could please change their name to the first and last name that you registered under so that we can take attendance, that would be great. In addition to changing your name, if you could include your pronouns so that we can honor everyone here, that would be appreciated as well. I want to briefly share more information for folks who may be joining us for the first time. As part of Denver PTC's SEBA funding, we're providing technical assistance in the West region to CDC directly funded community based organizations and their clinical partners to address social determinants of health, gender affirming and integrated services, and delivery of status neutral services for transgender and gender expansive people. We work closely with 15 jurisdictions in the West to collaboratively provide services for transgender people in alignment with the Ending the HIV Epidemic Initiative. If you are not a directly funded organization, we can and will be happy to provide TA support to you as well. Email me at zami.hemingway at dhha.org for additional information, and we'll be sure to drop that in the chat for you all as well. So today, COP, we will be discussing kink and fetish and how inclusion of these in sexual health programming allows for more open and honest communication between sexual health providers and the community, in particular, the transgender and non-binary communities. We wanna elevate kink communities because they offer safer spaces to openly discuss negotiation and consent with partners and broadens how we engage in sexual pleasure. For many transgender and non-binary kinksters, the kink community has been a place where they are able to receive gender affirmation, reclaim power around their sexual desires and expression, and provide comprehensive and accessible tools to negotiate boundaries, consent, and pleasure. Over the last two community practices, we have discussed how transgender bodies and sexuality has been hypersexualized, desexualized, and shamed in larger communal and societal settings, and have often been left out of comprehensive sexual health programming. For transgender and non-binary people, having community spaces that normalize discussing sexual wants, desires, and boundaries openly and honestly provides opportunity for transgender and non-binary people to advocate for how they want their bodies to be engaged with. Thus, affirming identity and bodily autonomy for the individual, normalizing pleasure as part of sexual engagement, and building self-efficacy and sexual negotiation. Thank you all again for being here today. I want to turn it over to Miss Jai Smith to begin our conversation on showing up as our sexual selves, discussing kink and fetish and sexual health. Thank you so much, Sami. Um, and thank you everyone for joining today for today's COP. So my name is Miss Jai. I have a master's in public health and I provide capacity building and technical assistance for gender affirming care and inclusion. Additionally, I am a proud member of the leather community and am an open kinkster who provides sexual health education within the kink community and kink and fetish education within the sexual health community. I am very excited to be here today. My pronouns are she, her, and he, him, and I am living in occupied Akimo O'odham and Payapash land or Phoenix, Arizona. I also want to take a moment to thank Talon Smith, who is unable to join us today for his contributions to today's presentation. So for today's community of practice, we're going to provide an overview of kink and fetish behaviors, what BDSM is and is not, and how all of this connects to sexual health and pleasure. Additionally, we will discuss how kink spaces can affirm one's identity and provide a sense of community for us as trans and non-binary people. We may have seen representations of kink and fetish in everything from print and online sources to TV and movies. And regrettably, these representations often miss the mark and at times by a large margin. 
This can create a negative impression of people who engage in fetish and kink, pushing people to keep such activities quiet and can create fear of disclosing activities to health providers. So it can create this fear of disclosing those activities. So let's take a moment and review the following myths and facts. We will pull up this quiz and you'll be able to select multiple choices. So please select all the statements that you believe are true. So the first statement is people engage in kink and fetish because they enjoy it. People who like kink and fetish are sexual deviants. Only a small percentage of folks have a kink or fetish. People who engage in kink and fetish are traumatized. All kinks and fetishes have a dominatrix and a submissive. Kink and fetish are just about sex or sexual behavior. Kinks and fetishes can be a positive outlet for sexual pleasure, gender affirmation, and self-discovery. A person engaging in kink or fetish has no boundaries. A person must have a lot of money to participate in kink or fetish. And kink and fetish communities are welcoming to all. So again, please select all the ones that you believe are true. And we'll give it about 15 more seconds for folks to answer. Wonderful. So we'll go ahead and end that. Thank you to everyone who shared their thoughts. We'll go ahead and share out the results to you all as well. So it looks like folks said that the true statements were statement one, people engage in kink and fetish because they enjoy it. Um, statement seven also got a number of votes. So kink and fetishes can be a positive outlet for sexual pleasure, gender affirmation, and self-discovery. And then we see that uh, number 10 also got a number of votes. So kink and fetish communities are welcoming to all. We'll be able to get through some of these and, and talk about these statements and what are myths and what are facts. But for the purpose of our poll, the true statements today were statements one, seven, and 10. We'll also talk about kink and fetish, not just as sex or sexual behavior and what that means to folks. So again, thank you so much for sharing those. So we are going to talk a little bit about what kink is and what kink is not, starting with what it is not. First, kink is not the, what we have seen from Fifty Shades of Grey. The kink scenes severely lack discussions of consent and show an abusive, manipulative relationship as part of a power dynamic. These books and movies create a kink space where dominance and submission roles are decided by the cisgender male character, Christian, and aren't up for discussion. Additionally, Christian manipulates, stalks, and isolates the cisgender woman character, Anna, to coerce her into agreeing to the dominant submissive arrangement. This portrayal of kink unfortunately ignores the wants and needs of all those involved and perpetuates the stigma that kink is always abusive. Kink is also not what viewers of Netflix saw in season one of Bonding, where again, there are issues of consent. When the protagonist, Tiff, was engaged in client sessions, there was no talk of boundaries, of limits, or expectations. And the folks, uh, and, and which are at the core, sorry, <laughs> which are at the core of healthy engagement in kink. Further, the first season narrative also perpetuates the stigma that kink is abusive and that folks choose to engage in kink because of previous assault and abuse, which is not true for a lot of those who enjoy kink. So now that we know a little bit about what kink is not, let's define what kink is and the spectrum of kink activities. And Ms. Jai, I just want to honor something that um, Julie Kane put into the chat. She disagreed with response number 10 because kink and fetish communities are not welcome to predators or consent violators. Thank you for saying that, Julian, and thank you for bringing that um, to the attention, Ty. Absolutely, I would agree with that statement, um, that there is a lot of work that we do within our kink communities to make sure that they are safe for folks to engage and not experience um, violence at the hands of people within that community. So thank you for, for pointing that out and that that blanket statement actually is not true. Um, so what I would love to hear from folks is how do you define the word kink? Or how would you define kink? So feel free to put it in the chat or you can take yourself off of mute.
So I've got a response from Stuart, sexual play that offers eroticness. Thank you. Other thoughts on how you would define kink? And Ms. Jai, I'll read the chat for you so you don't have to worry about it. I got thank you. you. Thank you. Lots of screens. <laughs> Come on, colleagues, what do you think of when you hear the term kink? And we're not talking about tight coils of hair on people from Africa. We're talking about other types of kink. Personal risk, informed consensual freedom with the choices over one's own bodily interactions with others. Something physically specific that gives specific sexual pleasures. Different behaviors that can be sexual or erotic. Awesome, thank you all for sharing those definitions. What about fetish? How would you define fetish? Um, we have two more definitions to... coming oh, in. Die before you go to the next one. Sexual freedom negotiated touch for the purposes of pleasure, sexual or not, consensual exploration. Thank you so much. So how would we define fetish then? And again, feel free, you can put those responses in the chat um, or you can take yourself off of mute. Or if you're thinking to yourself, I don't know how I would define this differently from kink, you can also put a one in the chat as well. We have a one in the chat. We have another one in the chat. Fetish equals gratification connected to a thing and not an expression with a person dependent on it. Another definition is something that is needed for pleasure. Kink may not be needed, but fetishes usually are, I think. Number one, another definition is something that you like. Fetish feels like it has to be the focus to physical or and or or behavioral act. Wonderful. Thank you all so much for sharing those. Um, so that we are on the same page, here are two kind of simplified definitions that we're going to be using when we discuss kink and fetish for today's presentation. So for a kink, a kink is a sexual interest or a fixation on an object or an act that can enhance sexual or non-sexual sensation for the individual. Kink is also much more common than people think. So five out of every 10 people have engaged in kink or some form of kink in their lifetime. And seven out of 10 people, of every 10 people have fantasized about kink activities. And we'll talk a little bit more in a moment about what kink activities can look like um, and what we are thinking of when we think of kink activities. People of all body types, sizes, shapes, races, ethnicities, genders, and physical abilities engage in kink. Kink is about community for many, and healthy engagement in kink centers on discussions of consent, boundaries, wants, and needs. So I was, as was mentioned before, kink communities really aren't spaces for predators or for folks who are engaging in non-consensual activities. And for those who partake alone or with a partner or partners, it can be freeing uh, a way to connect and to feel fulfilled. It can be sexy and sensual, or it could be non-sexual. It can be at home, in another space, or in a kink club, which are also more common than people may think. In kink contexts, we may also hear the words top and bottom, which can refer to penetration language as we often discuss in HIV prevention and care contexts, but it can also refer to non-sexual positioning in power exchange or roles played during a kink session. A fetish is a sexual interest or fixation, and I think someone said a focus, um, so it could be a fixation or a focus, on an object or an act that is necessary to achieve sexual gratification. What makes a kink different from a fetish is that a kink is something that can be added to a sexual situation um, to enhance pleasure for those involved, whereas a fetish is something that the individual requires to be involved 
in order to experience sexual satisfaction. We are going to talk uh, also talk today about how kink and fetish can look in non-sexual contexts, but for now let's focus on the sexual side. There are three main categories that most kinks and fetishes fall into, and they are given the acronym BDSM, which we will talk about in just a moment. Now that we have defined kink and fetish, I want to pause here and see what questions people have. Feel free to put any questions you have in the chat or take yourself off mute. Or if you're if we're good to go, you can give me a, a thumbs up or put a one in the chat as well. And we just want to say that it's very natural and beautiful to have kink and fetish ideas. This uh, this COP is not about othering. This COP is about belonging. We want people to belong. Mm -hmm. You're getting a lot of ones in the chat. Awesome. The chat. Then we will continue. So let's dive a bit deeper into the acronym I just mentioned. BDSM refers to three different types of kink. So bondage and discipline, dominance and submission, and sadism and masochism. Can anyone explain or give an example of what bondage or discipline could be referring to? Feel free to take yourself off mute or put your response in the chat. I can, I'll share with bondage and discipline, I think of folks who engage in rope play, so maybe tying someone up or potentially even giving someone orders around discipline. So, you know, go clean this kitchen or your house or doing different chores. In the chat we have, I always think of bondage as handcuffs, ropes, tape over the mouth. Physical punishment slash impact play, restraints, et cetera. And for those who aren't familiar with what impact play is, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about it in a moment as well. Bondage equals physical constraints. Discipline equals emotional, mental, behavioral constraints. Wonderful. Thank you all for those examples. This is great. Um, so then same question uh, around dominance and submission. Come on, colleagues share. We've seen different movies. Excellent. Play involving power, involving differing power dynamics, relationship, communication, roles, on per um, person gives over control to another. One person gives control over to another. Mm -hmm. Dominance equals willing to, uh, willing to be the authority figure, making decisions and taking accountability, accountability, accountability for actions. Submission equals receiver of decisions, actions, authority figure on communicating internal reality, taking power, taking roles to the power over power to submit role play power. Wonderful, thank you all so much. These are great and we can already see how some of these pieces are interplaying with one another as well, right? So giving up of power or taking on power, um, giving up of, or re referring to our accountability, taking on the accountability over the scene, taking on the accountability on how we're going to support um, one another, absolutely. Um, and then the third one is what does sadism and masochism mean? And again, feel free to put your responses in the chat or take yourself off mute. I think of pain, one respondent said. That's what I'm not sure of. Something super dominant?
Sadism equals comfortable mind space inflicting intense sensual pains. Masochism equals comfort, comfortable mind space feeling intense uh, sensation slash pain. Um, sexual enjoyment associated with inflicting or receiving pain. Thank you so much for these definitions. I really want to bring out something that Julie said, which is around intense sensations and pain. So sometimes we, when we think of sensation um, or intense sensations, they aren't necessarily always painful. So I really appreciate you bringing that to the forefront, um, because oftentimes when we talk about sadism and masochism, we, we focus on the pain aspect of it. So thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you, everyone, for your, for your responses to these. Um, so we have some basic definitions here as well on what these different pieces can look like and how they interact with one another. So bondage is the use of physical restriction through some material, things that we've already mentioned, right? So ropes, cuffs, chains, blindfolds, all these different things that can be used to tie someone up or physically restrain someone. Discipline is the giving up or taking control of a situation with some form of restriction. So it could be a physical restriction or psychological. So giving someone orders, telling someone to, like uh, Zami had mentioned, clean, um, those sorts of things are part of that discipline when there is a, a potential consequence or a reward associated with it as well. Dominance and submission are examples of power exchange as folks have already been mentioning, which is great that we're on the same page for it. Um, where one person is giving up control um, and one person is taking control of a situation. This is kind of an oversimplification of it, and I really appreciate the comments about accountability as well, um, because there is a lot of responsibility for the individual who is in the, the dominant role to make sure that safety, consent are constantly going on within that space. This does overlap with discipline, but does not always include a form of, of restriction, either physical or psychological. It could just be about that power dynamic shift. These can also sometimes be associated with gender roles um, and sometimes falsely associated with gender roles. E for example, like dominance is seen as masculine, submission is seen as feminine, though that's not always the case. And there's a lot of spaces where folks differ. Uh, there's lots of gender identities within the space and we're working to undo some of those um, gender normalizations around dominance and submission. Some examples of this power exchange uh, can come in many forms. So things like pet play, such as pup or kitty play, acts of servitude, um, or a, a, sir, uh, a sir boy or a madam um, girl relationship can also be present. And then sadism is deriving pleasure through the infliction of pain or intense sensation, whereas masochism is the deriving of pleasure through the experience of pain or intense sensation. So some common tools of the trade include items for impact play, which was mentioned earlier. So floggers, paddles, canes, anything where you're going to be physically, um, physically hitting the skin. Electrical stimulation uh, or e-stim, hot wax, and piercing equipment are all examples of um, sadism and masochism tools. These categories are not separate, and often there is overlap of power dynamics and engaging in bondage or pain play, um, and these interests can happen on a spectrum, ranging from, for example, fantasizing about being paddled um, to lifestyle. To, for, so for example, for that, having a long-term power dynamic relationship with a sir. So we can see them both as these fleeting fantasies, as well as something that exists in a, in a daily life. But these are just some examples of a variety of kinks that exist out there. And I see there was a note that came through. It is important to note that there's a distinction between kink sadists and individuals with sadistic behaviors. Getting off on hurting others non-consensually is not the same as enjoying the mental space when making room for these activities. Thank you so much. I think that came from Julie. Thank you, Julie, for bringing that up. Absolutely. When we talk about sadism, oftentimes we talk about um, depictions like quills or the Marquis de Sade or this, this idea of I'm gonna inflict harm on someone because I find it really pleasurable. Um, and when we were talking in the context of consensualizing kink um, and being in kink spaces and kink community, it's being able to negotiate what that looks like, what our boundaries are and 
pre and preparing ourselves for what that's going to look like and being able to stop or slow play um, in ways that are that everyone is enjoying and engaging mindfully in that play. So I really appreciate you pointing out the difference between uh, kink status and someone with individual sadistic behaviors. So because these are just examples of a, vari of a variety of kinks that exist out there, um, we would love for you all to unmute or share in the chat box, what are some other kinks that you've heard about or have questions about? Um, so what are other things that you've heard about in your work and sexual health um, or have questions about? I would love to know about the colors of the bandanas I see in front of me. Another sure. question comes in, what is pup? What is a pup? I've seen a lot of images of social media of people being pups. Is this just dog love that I'm seeing? Tell us more about that. Um, well, so I think that we are, as a community of practice, there's a lot of knowledge within this room and already in some of the things that I'm hearing back and forth, I can tell that there's there are folks that are coming into the space with, infer with knowledge about kink and fetish communities. So I would love to hear from folks, if anyone has a definition of what a pup is or what pet play is, I'd love to hear that in the chat. Um, this is the way that I think about pet play um, or like a pup or a kitty. Um, or any other kind of animal. I've met someone who's also a giraffe because um, they're super tall. Uh, so it's a mixture of discipline. So this idea of like reward and uh, reward and consequence um, and taking on a power play situation with folks where someone is acting as a pet and someone is acting as a, a handler for that individual. Um, so the idea isn't necessarily I'm having, I'm engaging with someone who is an animal. It's not about bestiality, although oftentimes there are, there is this like false equivalent that is made to it. It's more about being able to be in a headspace where an individual doesn't have to think about um, their, what they're doing because they know that there's someone looking out for them or there are others looking out for them in the space. So we might engage in things like moshes where folks are acting like uh, a bunch of dogs together and are roughhousing or wrestling or playing with balls or toys. Um, and it's an opportunity to sort of tap into that inner, like almost like an inner child um, in a way that we're able to get together and have fun and be goofy with one another, knowing that there's there are other folks who are looking out for our best interests to make sure we're not roughhousing too hard or we're not um, in, endangering ourselves or other people in those situations. And then there are also spaces where um, folks don't have handlers and it's just an opportunity to build community around um, going into this, this almost like submissive space um, or subspace where we're able to kind of let go of control of a situation that's happening around us, um, which can be a really powerful way for us to engage in those spaces as well. Thank you. There are some comments in the chat, a uh, comment that says littles. I'm hoping we can get more information about that. Then there's another comment that says, this is a fascinating topic. It's not talked about a lot, it's healthy. And I feel like there are taboos, judgments about it. And then there's a request again from the man reading who would like to know about the bandanas that he sees before me. <laughs> um, so for the bandanas, so the bandanas are um, from the, they, they originate from the hanky code which was a way for folks, specifically uh, cisgender gay men. Um, it was a nonverbal way of expressing interest, especially when engaging in kink or engaging in same gender sexual activity was criminalized. Um, so worn on the left, a handkerchief generally indicates topping in some sort of kink activity, whereas worn on the right, it indicates bottoming in that activity. So for example, the picture that we have here, um, the, the person is telling us a lot about their interests and kink. Um, so for this image, we, are, we know that because things that are on the left, that the individual is a fisting top because of the red handkerchief, that they are heavy sadism top with the black bandana or heavy into, um, it could also be heavily into bondage, that they are a toy or dildo top with the light pink and that they're interested in rimming as a top. Um, with the beige, so rimming being anal oral contact. 
And then on the right side, we have that they enjoy being urinated on with the yellow or they're interested in um, urine play or water sports that they also like to bottom in penetrative sex with the dark blue, um, so receiving an anal sex, and that they enjoy performing oral sex with the light blue. That is beautiful. We have a comment <laughs> in the chat. I think of pet and Little's play like a sexy meditative funku, I'm sorry, funku practice, um, kung fu practice with outfits that are more fun. That's a simplified and relaxed mental state that if you can train your brain to slip into it, you can have a period of time, a period of time free of the social constraints of politeness, speech, et cetera, to be free in your body. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. That is um, a really great way for us to think of subspace as well as the ability to sort of like slip into this space of mindfulness. Um, I think about how uh, for pups, I know several pups that they'll put on their pup hood and do things like play video games or they'll put on their pup hood and meditate or they'll put on their pup hood just because they want the opportunity to sort of shut down some of the portions of their own their own brain that are overthinking or overanalyzing or um, because they've had a stressful day. And so I think that that gets into some of the aspects of how uh, kink and engaging in these ways go beyond just the sexual gratification components. So we might have someone who is interested in throwing up a social with pups, and we're just coming together to play a board game in pup hoods or something of that nature, because then we're able to just sit around and, and be goofy and silly with one another, or not think about these other anxieties or worries that might be present for us. And then for littles, for folks who are unfamiliar, so like littles and bigs, um, it is also a, a form of age play for folks. And so it can also have this ritual, ritualistic aspect of there's some sort of item or there's some sort of uh, outfit piece that helps folks get into this headspace of sort of like releasing or letting go of control of the situation. So it could be when I put on my onesie, then I'm no longer needing to to think or be um, my adult self right now. I can just be uh, almost like a lizard brain where I, I just move with action. I, I move with purpose and don't have to th hyper think about what it is that I'm going to be doing. Um, or it could be like whenever I have my binky, then that's when I feel like I'm, I'm a little and, I, and it gives me comfort in some situations as well. Um, or I can be in a social situation and it's, it's helping me relax some of my social anxiety about engaging with strangers. So there's lots of ways that that can look for folks as well. Um, and thank you for sharing these. I, there, um, when we think about kinks, I think some of the additional kinks we might hear about in sexual health programming might be things like behavioral kinks, such as, like I mentioned, fisting. Um, we might also hear about like fluid exchange. Um, we might hear about role play kinks, such as like dressing up. Um, in certain ways, so dressing up as a vampire or as a maid or pretending to be a stranger, those could all be role play kinks. Um, and then expression kinks, such as becoming part of the leather community or wearing lingerie as a way to affirm gender identity and feel sexy. So uh, additionally, kink can sometimes go beyond just physical pleasure and provide space for gender identity and sexual affirmation and a safe way for us to explore our identities um, without the shame or fear of exploring those identities um, just out in the world. I already mentioned the, the hanky code. I think that it can be helpful for us to know some of the colors and associations depending on the setting that we are working in as a way to start conversations about sexual health and kink. So if we saw someone wearing all of these bandanas out in the world, um, or like in the bar that we were working in or where we were doing outreach, likely they're not wearing this many bandanas just so that they have places to blow their nose. They're likely flagging in this hinky code way. So it's important for us to, to recognize when those things come up. And though not everyone who engages in kink advertises them in this way, it can be really helpful for us in all sexual health conversations to include some questions inquiring about kink. So going beyond the physical aspects, kink can also provide gender and sexual affirmation for ourselves as expressed through this quote. I'd consider kink to be a large part of my identity, both sexually and as a person. 
I joined the kink community a little over a year ago, mostly to take part in BDSM. I've always been interested in bondage specifically, even before I could identify it as a kink. I have it to thank for my sexual awakening, Shabari in particular. While it is certainly a sexual thing for me, I also see it as an art form. But instead of acrylics and paper, the body is the canvas and the ropes are the medium. Shibari helped me to see my body not as something to loathe, but rather a canvas waiting to be painted. Which first I'll just say is a really beautiful thing to think about as well, our bodies as canvases to be painted. So this person references Shibari, which is a Japanese rope bondage technique. And in Japanese, Shibari simply means to tie. And I see that there are some questions that are- I got you, I got you, Miss 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 Jai. I got you, that's my job. <laughs> please, don't, please don't unemploy me. Um, <laughs> one question is, are bandanas used by any, everyone? I, so I think it depends on which communities you're in. So they started or were like were rooted out of cisgender gay male communities, but I know a lot of folks of um, multiple identities uh, or who hold multiple identities or who are not part of the cisgender gay male community who do use bandanas um, to sort of flag what their interests are. So I, I think if you're in leather communities or if you're in kink communities, then it's pretty common to see bandanas as a way to flag what our interests are. And then the next question is, do you have any good resources, websites to learn more information on the hinky code? Yeah, during the Q&A section, I'll pull up one of the websites that I use um, because there is there is a lot. <laughs> there are lots of codes um, and they go, there's a lot of like the shade of uh, hanky code could mean something different and the material that's used could mean something different. So because there are so many different uh, potential uh, colors that can be used, I generally have to go back to that for ones that aren't, um, that I, that I don't see super frequently. So yeah, I can share that during the Q and A. Um, so kink also provides spaces for all people to engage in pleasure and normalize consent. For trans and non-binary people, this can provide us a safe space for us to work through our relationship with our gender identity and sexuality, um, as we can see in this second quote. Kink is more than just a fun pastime. It most certainly is that, but for many of us, it offers so much emotional release, bonding experiences, or any number of other things. For me, it offered me a chance to finally come into my own sexuality as a woman, to embrace who I am, and to not let the various societal biases I was raised with prevent me myself from achieving happiness. I can't speak for anyone else but myself, but from the trans people I have met in my sexual misadventures, a common story is how kink played a great role in allowing them to feel at peace with their identity. For myself, being a member of the kink community, I remember going to my first leather event and meeting someone who, after chatting for a few minutes, began to share their sexual boundaries, how they like to engage, and what they need present in order to experience pleasure. The conversation was both shocking because I had never heard someone discuss sexual interests so nonchalantly, but also assuring because it allowed me to make informed decisions on what I was willing to or unwilling to consent to. These two quotes touch just the tip of the kink iceberg of how exploration in kink allows us to reclaim sexual joy. Um, it can also be a way to experience gender affirmation in our bodies and provide space for psychological safety and release of emotions. And it normalizes discussions of consent. So as we are discussing kink and how we experience pleasure, I'm wondering for you all, um, why do you think pleasure is central to sexual health? Please feel free to unmute yourself or put your response in the chat. And I'll just put... Well, I'll, I'll share. I feel that um, when people talk about sexual health, or when I at least think about the sexual health education I received coming up as a young queer trans person, it was always about prevention and getting tested and making sure your friends and partners were tested. Uh, but they never, and how consent was important, 
but never really gave tools about how to negotiate consent, what negotiating was, or even being sure to know what brings you pleasure. And so as a young adult, a young teenager, I'd never thought about pleasure in regards to my sexual identity. It wasn't until I became an adult that I started really thinking about that. Thank you for sharing that, Sami. The thing that uh, comes to mind for me around pleasure is also that pleasure is a, a motivator for lots of ways that we like to engage as well. Um, and so it's important for us to think about sexual health from the perspective of what is motivating us to engage in, in specific ways. In the chat we have, pleasure is important because it removes shame slash stigma and normalizes sexuality and pleasure in the conversation. Mm. Yes, thank you so much. So if we know that pleasure is central to sexual health, then how can kink, how is kink or fetish a conduit for that pleasure? Please feel free to, you can unmute yourself or put your responses in the chat. If our sexuality doesn't include pleasure, then it can feel too medical or far away to want to understand intimately. Absolutely. The question is, how is kink or fetish a conduit for our pleasure? I think it goes back to what you were saying and what several folks in the chat were saying around how kink and fetish really focus on consent and what brings you pleasure and negotiating what brings you pleasure, figuring out what brings you pleasure um, and allows you to express that. And so that's how I think kink and fetish is a conduit for that because it gives you the space to explore it um, with safety, with other folks supporting in it and keeping that container as well. Some comments in the chat are freedom of expression. Hmm. Kink spaces make room for social acceptance of the radical idea that people can be able to experience their bodies how they want, regardless of age, shape, size, color, language, kink, et cetera, et cetera. Your body deserves to have a safe space to feel pleasure and kink folks understand that it can take place in a group that makes this kind of space, uh, this kind of safe space real. It can take the place of making love and gives people a focus as an activity in a way to connect, sexually connect. Thank you all so much for sharing those thoughts on kink and pleasure. I, I really appreciate the wealth of knowledge that we have in this group. Um, I wanna share some additional ways that kink and fetish can be a conduit for pleasure. And some of these we have already been shared as well. So kink expands understanding and engagement of pleasure beyond physical penetration to broader ways that sexual pleasure can be explored. Kink assessment as part of a comprehensive sexual health assessment allows for greater engagement around health services and insight into how the individual relates to their own bodies and establishes relationships. It teaches us more about our relation to ourself. Safety, consent, and negotiation are core components of engagement in the kink community, leading to focusing on pleasure and engaging with full informed consent. Understanding our fetishes and what we need to experience to experience our pleasure helps us to advocate for those needs and centralize pleasure in our sexual relationships as necessary. And on the other side of the relationship, 
having fetishes communicated to us from our partners allow us to allows us to make informed decisions on how we are willing to engage sexually and non-sexually and have open and honest communication around our boundaries and ultimately builds more trust between the between the folks that we're engaging with So we are going to do, we were going to do a breakout room, um, but because we're a smaller group today, I think we can just go ahead and go through um, one of the scenarios. Um, but what we're going to be doing is we're going to go through a scenario and then talk about ways as sexual health educators um, and from sexual health programs that we can prepare to have a conversation about sexual health, pleasure, and kink, that we can ask for permission to discuss sexual health, pleasure, and kink, and that we can and some example questions of how we can start that conversation. So we recognize that sometimes talking about sexual health, pleasure, and kink can feel off-putting or daunting when discussing sexual health. I think part of that maybe gets back to that the comment about the medicalization of sexual health as well. Um, so if we are coming from this perspective of we are a professional and, and this person is here to receive services, it can feel like we have to have a certain level of distance um, from that person. And we often think of medicalizing sexual health in this way of um, only talking about anatomy, not talking about anything sometimes related to pleasure um, or the ways that we engage. And so we want to start talking about how we can have these challenging conversations and push some past some of that discomfort um, with the permission of the person we're working with so that we're able to talk about some of those core motivators um, for the folks that we are supporting. To help make starting these conversations e easier, um, we're gonna go first through a scenario and then I'll prompt with some questions. Um, think about, uh, for the scenario, think about different things you could say to start a conversation about sexual health, pleasure, and kink. Think about how you could prepare ahead of time for a conversation, what questions you could ask first, and how you could ask for permission to discuss these things. So let me just stop sharing really quick so I can pull up the scenario. All right, can folks see the, the picture of a leather jacket with a pin on it? where it says scenario one, awesome. So I'm gonna go ahead and read the scenario and then we'll, uh, we'll have a chance to chat around it. So a non-binary person has been attending health services for the past few months. They show up for testing today and begin answering the standard sexual health questions. While completing the assessment, you notice a pin on their jacket with the leather pride flag on it, which that's, if you've never seen it before, that pin is the leather pride flag. So first, how could we prepare to have conversations about sexual health, pleasure, and kink with the, with the folks that we're providing services to? Feel free to put your response in the chat um, or take yourself off mute. Do you mind repeating the question? Oh, you put it in chat. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So think about before we even see this person in our in our environment, in our clinic, or in our outreach, or wherever we're providing services, how can we prepare ourselves ahead of time to have these conversations? I was just going to share that um, this is, <laughs> there's so much work that would have to be done in a clinical space for clinical providers to, to feel comfortable. Number one, the general population of clinical providers don't feel comfortable talking about sex, period, let alone you know broadening the conversation. So I know a few years back, we started to ask providers to at least ask about pleasure. And I think with as with most things that we're learning to do this new, it might be helpful for teams to get together and start to learn more about uh, kink and pleasure and, you know, just really like we're doing today, I think somebody already said that, start to practice it in a 
safe space so we're not bumbling through it with our clients and patients, but start to just, oh, let's play around with, with some of these conversations of asking someone, tell me a little bit more about what brings you pleasure. I noticed your pen or, you know, things like that. So that's what comes to my mind because I come from the clinical space and I know how you know, it's the providers that are uncomfortable, not the patients having the conversation. So in the chat, we have stay informed, uh, stay informed like attending this training. Another response is practice building rapport and asking for consent sharing uh, what the client can expect during the appointment. Practice speaking about these topics out loud with someone who's comfortable talking about them within professional parameters, and then someone liked that particular comment. The last comment is do your own research, push beyond your own discomfort, build relationships uh, with different communities, including the kink community. The, next, the last comment is especially if you can find someone brave enough to point out your assumptions, microaggressions, or embedded biases that you may not know about when communicating about these topics. And someone like that, uh, next is shadow observed providers who are experienced, comfortable talking about kink pleasure. I would also just add to that, we need to build our own language. We sound so clinical. We don't talk like this when we're talking with our friends. I don't say, what, what kind of kink are we discussing today? No, <laughs> no, I, I, I build a language that I can use. And, and I feel like we need to get that language and build that, that facility with the human language. Absolutely. And I think the, the other thing, things that we can think about ahead of time is, is just learning more about um, what is happening in our community. So if, if we saw this flag pin and we didn't know what it was, we wouldn't think to ask about it as well, right? So there's lots of things that, what well, we don't know, we just don't know. And so if we're getting an opportunity to come to trainings like this, to talk to members from those communities, to learn more around the way that they build, that folks build relationships, the way that we um, enjoy pleasure and kink and our sexual health, then it helps us to be more informed when we're preparing for these as well. In the interest of time, I also want to move a little bit forward. Um, we could also ask for permission. And I, I know that folks, uh, I think Bev had said like, oh, I see that pin on your bag. Tell me a little bit more about that. I think getting informed consent before jumping into something that can be incredibly personal is always a, a best practice for us to do. Just because someone is comfortable being a, an out member of the kink community doesn't mean they necessarily want to have that conversation with a provider if they don't trust that person or if it's their first visit. Um, I am speaking publicly about being a member of the kink community and a sexual health educator. And the first time I'm meeting with a primary care doctor, this might not be what I talk about because we don't have that relationship yet, right? And so asking for permission to talk about these things, um, asking about it saying like, I'm gonna be discussing sexual health today, which will include pleasure and kink. Are you comfortable talking about that today? These are great ways that we can sort of um, let folks know that this is a door that's open to them to talk about with us, but also put the, the control into their hands around how they're gonna navigate the situation with us. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing and I'm gonna move us along via PowerPoints. Give me just a moment. There's an additional comment. Um, Ju uh, there's additional comment. So also practice humility, demonstrate if you don't know, and follow with making space comfortable for a person to share if they wish to. And then another comment about humility. Thank you so much. I want to elevate some of the voices of the leaders in um, our kink and fetish communities. Um, so we've talked a lot about the conduit for pleasure. We've talked about sexuality and, and sexual experiences within these settings, but there are lots of folks who also build community within kink and fetish settings. And so there are leather contests and pageants 
that which we'll discuss more in a moment. There are community gatherings like pride and leather pup events, and there are educational events that are hosted by the community to explore different aspects of kink, including basics, safety, and consent in the kinky spaces. Um, there are also social groups that form around common shared identity. Uh, this in the upper left hand corner, this is a photo of the leather club onyx, which was formed and is operated by people of color who enjoy the leather lifestyle. So there are organizations that develop in order to make safe space safe and inclusive spaces within kink and fetish communities as well and we we have, have, oh, i'm sorry just go ahead there's a comment in the chat just want to get this in knowing how to communicate informed consent is a huge overlap between clinical and kink environments absolutely Absolutely. And the materials that we create, um, we won't get a chance to talk a lot about that, but the materials that we create, the ones that emphasize consent and the ability for us to negotiate these spaces, those messages also resonate very deeply with kink and fetish communities because it is so core to the ways that we engage with one another and the expectations we have about the spaces that we create. And so if we're looking at how can we create materials that are going to resonate with the community, having a, con a consent lens in the way that we're talking about sexual health is going to help resonate with that with our community. I'm not gonna get a chance to share this video, but I encourage folks to look up the video of Jack Thompson um, when they spoke about Trans Day of Visibility in 2021. Jack Thompson is the first transgender person of color to hold the Mr. International Leather title and speaks about how kink in the leather community has helped him feel seen. And then I wanna elevate another, a couple other leaders in our community. So this is Trey Onyx, who is a kink educator and the first black trans man titled Mr. San Francisco Leather, and Sam Brinton, who is a non-binary kink educator and a nuclear waste scientist. So for us being in community and being invested in our health also means being invested in our successes and celebrations and seeing us as whole people outside of just kink and fetish. Here are a bunch of other wonderful photos that I was going to go over with you all, but I really want to emphasize that we have there's a lot of trans and non-binary people who create and take up space in kink and, fe and fetish communities. Um, and for a lot of us, this is a way for us to feel comfortable, explore our identities, and also build community with one another um, in spaces that already talk about gender identity and the ways that we can be seen as whole people. So this is a number of the leather title holders as well. And the video for Jack is in the chat. Uh, you can click on it, open up that video and save it before our time ends today. So I'm going to go ahead and give us the opportunity then to talk about um, how we can invest in our community. And I think I stopped sharing by accident. So let me just pull that back up. So as sexual health providers, when we invest in the health and, and wellness of the trans and non-binary kink communities and how it's important for us to think about additional ways that we can be inclusive of kink in our programming um, beyond just sexual health. So we can build presence in the community by being present at events and collaborating with local kink and fetish clubs. We can work with local trans and non-binary members of the kink community to inform our sexual health programming, including getting feedback and implementing that feedback. We can bring services to kink spaces um, like munches, which are educational opportunities. Um, we can take our services to dungeons and bathhouses and socials and leather contests. We can expand sexual health assessment and history to include conversations on pleasure, kink, consent, and sexual rights. And finally, we can integrate consent into every aspect of health discussions. So as we were just mentioning, asking consent to discuss sexual health, asking consent to touch a patient before touching them, even if we're doing things like a lung or heart check, and learning how to support non-monogamous relationships in medical decision-making and navigation. So for your organization, if you're working in a hospital or a clinical setting, do you know how you would support non-monogamous couples in making sure everyone had the ability to make medical decisions on each other's behalf? We can learn those pieces and then provide that information to our communities who build relationships in those ways. So I wanna give us some opportunity. I know we're at time, but what additional questions do folks have about kink, fetish, BDSM, or anything we've discussed today?
feel free to unmute yourself or put your questions in the chat. And while those questions are coming in, I'm gonna go ahead and pull up that hanky code. So Julie uh, placed a comment in the chat. Um, Julie says, acts before assuming about bruises, apparent needle wounds, or seemingly controlling relationship communication practices. That's a great point, thank you. I just uh, went ahead and put the the hanky code link. Um, it the link for itself also shares a little bit more of the history of the hanky code and where it's kind of come from. And I would say that this is also not a definitive list. That there are that just like language and the ways that we choose to uh, to interact with one another, there's constantly shifting in the ways that we engage around um, kink and fetish and how we discuss the hanky code specifically. And we just have, thank you for this presentation. What a great and much needed topic. Would you be willing to host a follow-up session on clinically appropriate phrasing and sentence prompts for opening discussions on these topics with clients? That is a great question. Yes, we will be willing to do that. So we will take a note of that question and comment. And then thank you and thank you for all this information it was extremely insightful and helpful you're just getting lots of love in the chat Miss shy so it seems like we don't have questions but before everyone goes <laughs> we want to thank you all for being here today our next session will be in november and we'll be focusing on supporting transgender and non-binary veterans so please come out to that community of practice we'll be sending out a save the date in the upcoming weeks also in november we'll be hosting a regional webinar called Gender Affirming Care for People with HIV, which will be focused on how to integrate HIV and gender affirming care in your clinics, CBOs, and health departments. We will also have the Save the Date and Registration link for that out soon as well in the upcoming weeks. Also, everyone will be receiving an email by 6 p.m. Mountain Standard Time or 6 p.m. Mountain uh, Daylight Time with a link to a survey. Please complete the survey. We love your feedback. And for a TA requests, please uh, contact me at zami.hemingway at dhha.org or do a request through your CTS. Thank you all so much. We hope you have a great rest of your week and day.